Wigan. I'm Margie Wigan, and this is Lisa Jackson. We're excited to have you here with us tonight, and we hope you will join in on the conversation. Yes. All the ways to contact us are, should be on the bottom of the screen. We have a phone number, 508-435-7880, and you can email us live at hcam.tv, or there's a Facebook connection. It's all right there on the screen. We want to be uh, including you in our conversation, not just talking amongst ourselves. We do have a guest in our second segment, but the first segment is just going to be us talking, so please join us. Yes. We're going to talk about uh, the conversation around changing the start time for middle school, high school. Yeah, it was interesting. I've been talking to my daughter. She's an eighth grader about this, and she's like, oh, no, I didn't want it. I don't want it to start later. Yeah. But she's also, you know, like she worries about not having enough time to have homework after school you know to do her homework but she's also in a lot of classes that you know she's in some of the ap classes so i think it makes you know they have more homework so i think it depends on the kid and her friends of course i talk to and they're kind of in the same boat did you get any feedback from molly or well i don't know i my oldest yeah was because i know for me it works for me to go to bed at a similar time yeah and get up at a similar time right and um so that I can think, you know? And gotcha. so my oldest was in that frame of mind. Yeah. So she went to bed at pretty, pretty regularly time, yep. pretty reg whatever, 9.30, 10 yep. ish. So she could get up and she was one of the kids that wasn't dragging themselves around half asleep. Right. So she consequently could think and answer questions and be awake. Right. So I think that was a big reason why she was could, able to do could that. do well and i i mean i'm a little different because i do disaster response so of course my hours sometimes bounce around a little bit and i do a lot of evening things and you know i do okay with the changes but you know like and celia seems to have my wherewithal on that but she does like during the week she does like to have that schedule like it's usually 9 30 10 o'clock she goes to bed right gets up at six yeah you know and, and gets ready for school and does and... she have trouble getting up at six no so the, the, see that's where the thing is my yeah. eyes pop open me too it doesn't matter you know if i go to bed late i'm still oh. gonna wake up six seven oh, o'clock see yeah so yeah. that's why for me i it's better if I go to bed, you know, but if I obviously stay up late. Right. And then what worked for me is take a nap in the afternoon, but that's another story. Right. Um, but yeah, what was interesting about the research, um, when I looked at some of the information, National Sleep Foundation was talking about um, teens really needing an average of nine and a quarter hours of sleep oh. for optimal performance. So if they need nine hours. That's, that's a little tight. And they go to bed at 11. Right. That puts them waking up at eight o'clock. Right. School start time is seven thirty. Right. So they are need, they're getting up an hour earlier, which shouldn't be that bad. Right. Um, but really, the interesting thing I found was that it was saying that most adolescents have a, a shift in their sleep cycle so that they can't fall asleep. Even though they're exhausted, uh -huh. um, they have a hard time really falling asleep before eleven o'clock. Um, undergo a sleep phase delay which means a tendency toward later times for falling asleep and waking up. Typical adolescent natural time, maybe 11 p.m. or later, Interesting. Um, may feel wide awake at bedtime even when they're exhausted. So, so, so there are the studies that show that. that it... Yeah, well, this was from 98, and it's one study, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing about that study um, also investigated what happened if they, if they paid people, student adolescents, to have light you know blinders yeah and go to bed at a set time and wake up at a set time and they found they could reset the clock right so they could. Of the light yeah yep i do we that were. with my chickens with laying eggs in winter <laughs> I, don't <laughs> I, put, yeah. I don't know if we want to compare chickens and no no but the light has an effect on all of us is of what i'm saying exactly. you know like even chickens so like the light is definitely a, <laughs> yeah you know a thing right so this says with time effort and money researchers can get adolescents to reset their clocks but this may not work for kids who have busy lives. You know, right. if they have sports and then they have right. homework, they're going to end up being awake till 11 o'clock. And that's what happens. I mean, like, Celia does band and she yeah. does drama and, you know, most of those things, you know, right. or at least after school. So she's, she, you know, maybe she gets home at four or five and then she has three or four, five hours, four hours of homework is about three to five, 
four hours seem to be her average time for homework. So then, yeah, you know, they don't really have downtime, too. So I think sometimes right. when they crank it right up to bedtime when they're doing homework, it's hard to shut their brains off so right. they can get sleep, too. Right. So that's one thing I noticed. A little bit with Celia, she's a pretty pliable like I am, because I can, I'm an on-off switch, so that kind of, you know, some people are just wired that way, but I think, you know, people in general, I think that's a tough, tough thing, you know, like, particularly if you're thinking a lot, and you're, you're using your brain a lot, and then to actually try to go to sleep without trying to process what you've been doing. Right, right. I had a friend who actually, um, in college, I can remember her saying that she used to visualize a blackboard. Yeah. And she'd write all the things on the blackboard that she was thinking, <laughs> and then she'd erase them. Yeah. I think her name was Francine. No kidding. So she she visualized that, and then she could go to sleep. That's because I know there are people technique. that, that yeah. have all that those thoughts at bedtime. Right. Um, it's hard to turn that off. Well, I used to. So I guess when I start a new project or something I don't know a lot about, I kind of throw myself into it and I try to learn as much as I can. And then I find myself, like my brain thinking and what I've learned is I use my notes piece on my phone and in times I've written it down. So I, I don't, I worry about not keeping that thought, which kids may do when they're studying. They're like, oh, I got to remember this. I got to remember this. But if they write it down or do something, some exercise that makes them feel comfortable with stopping to right, think turning of, off the yeah, brain. not thinking about it anymore so for me that was a tool i learned as i got older right but not in adolescence no so that's no. what the question is right how do we look at this you know there are several things to look at there's one there, there are the sleep studies right and they're talking about um that combination of light yes you know if you if you can and timing, keep it dark yeah. And timing and, yep. and quiet. Yeah. You know, if there is noise in the house, it's going to be hard for anybody to go to sleep. Right, right. So there are all these pieces that fit together. And then I think there's the piece of the after school activities. Right. You know, so if the neighboring towns, and I think at this point there were only three towns right. in the area which have uh, the later start time. Ah. So if we're playing sports against other towns right that'll and, affect and, so the kid may come home for an hour and then that get that kind of through throws the rhythm off a little bit too because what do you do with an hour you know right. what i mean so instead of doing something like right after school you know with other as long as our times are all the same mm -hmm. do we have any communities around us that yes and i um i had that on there was a thread on um with Amy Ritterbush actually gave some input on that. Oh, awesome. Just, I would just have to find it, um, but I don't Yeah, know so that that's something to think about. The issue Margie brought up is like, you know, we do partner or work or compete against other schools all the time. Right. And if they have a different start time, then that's, uh, you know, that is certainly a factor in what we do, um, you know, with, with our children. And again, if you have a lag time of an hour there's not a lot you can do with that that's productive. Right. Um, I, it was three towns in yeah. our, in, but but none of them were in the Tri-Valley League. Oh, okay. So our sports, our sports our leagues own. are Tri-Valley. Right, right. So none of the other teams in our So it wouldn't league. be sports, but it might be debate or so, uh, something like that. It could that be or, anything. I mean, the, so, so one piece is the other schools and after schools activities. Right. And then there's um, homework. Right. Kids have jobs right. after school um you know and then then if we start later right. there is also the issue of working parents i know the boston sure. school department was has discussed this and i think back on december 6 the boston school committee voted to approve the start of the high school after eight o'clock and mm. elementary to end before 4 p.m because ah. they don't want the kids in the buses during the uh, rush, rush hour, hour right you know because that, that's crazy sure um and then the parents preferred 8 to eight thirty start time interesting yeah i like it earlier but that's that's just me right well then then the question is what do you do with the kids when they get out at two what do the parents do with the kids if the parents need to leave for work and the child isn't being picked up on right. the bus until eight o'clock now instead of seven o'clock right so then, and I mean, I think what well, was interesting when Celia was getting older, so legal age to leave a child home home alone is 11, but at 11, I wasn't quite, I wouldn't be comfortable with Celia on her own. 
you know, now we're just 13 is when we kind of started, mm -hmm. you know, little stints of time alone. Mm -hmm. So getting on a bus, there's a lot of, you know, yeah. question marks with that. You yeah. know what I mean? Unless a lot of kids group together, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's that that's the question that comes up with. But the parents start time. You know, I think a lot of people look at that as well. And I think it depends on the community, maybe. Right. On what the start time, what people prefer. Exactly. You know, because when Celia started later, um, I preferred the earlier time because I get a ton of work done in the morning. And, right. You know, and then it just, for me personally, it worked out better. You right. know, so it. Although if there's a snowstorm, right, it's nice to be able to get up and shovel, right, right, before not you be have in to... the dark in the winter. Yeah, yes. so there are all all kinds of reasons um, sure. for both. But then to play devil's advocate a little bit, I mean, I think it's good for children to be able to be adaptable to time. Exactly. You know, because life is not usually scheduled. You know what I mean? And particularly in today's world, like we don't you know, have a set schedule. Like I work from home, so, you know, I have meetings and stuff like that, but I really don't have a set schedule. I have my own schedule that Celia goes off to school, I go home, I start working and get a bunch of stuff done. And, you know, the schedule kind of pops around, but, you know, I think it's, it's good for the kids also to be used to changing things. And another thing that came to mind is, I don't know about Molly, but like Celia sleeps in on the weekend. She'll stay up later. Yep. And she'll sleep in, which right. is, I'm glad she does. I'm like, good, you get to relax. You've been working all week. But it doesn't seem to affect her. To on, get up on Monday. On Mondays. That's but good. But I, I know some kids, some of my friends are like, yep. oh, my God, and my kids are dragging themselves out of bed. And, right. You know, so, I mean, that it, I'm sure it depends on the kid. But I think it's also good for them to have that flexibility. But I think studies, sleep studies... And this is why I was trying to insist, you know, yeah. encourage my kids to do this. Yeah. Sleep studies show that it's if better you, if you're in yeah, a pattern. it's like jet lag. Right. It's like giving yourself jet lag because now you've changed sure. your pattern yep. to going to bed later, getting up later. Then you have to jet lag yourself for Monday to get up on Monday morning right. at six, six thirty. Right. So some people adjust to jet lag better than others. Right. Right. Um, you know, and obviously, if you're staying up, you want to go to that party and have that fun thing. Right. Um, so it is hard Monday morning. Right. Um, and and if the sleep studies show that, that makes you know, yeah. I know speaking for myself, that's not representative probably right. most of the population. You know what I mean? So that's something. You know, I think you know if the majority, it's, it's better. The, well, and and know. right, but and as you, there's. For every rule, there's right. an exception. Absolutely. And it's a majority rule. So right. clearly there are some people for whom that isn't a problem. Right. And I think of people who do split shifts or they work right. all-nighters all or there, there, there's a guy on this, the main road who's, I can hear his truck turn on. It yep. used to be at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yep. And now, you know, maybe more was 3 o'clock and now it's down to 2, 2.30. Yeah. I don't know. So... He that's his that's, that's his, his schedule. Rhythm. Yeah, that's his algorithm or his sleep rhythm and his pattern. Like, yeah. Yep. So it's an interesting concept. Um, we would love to have your input on this. Talk to your kids while you're sitting there watching our show, hopefully, <laughs> and and see what you know what they think. You right. know, or what do you think? Is this going to be inconvenient for parents? Right. Is it going to be? Uh, is it a good idea if we get some? Uh, well, the buses go on the road at different times. Right. Because we're going to have. You know, one one round of buses takes right. Hopkins and and right. one takes Center, Elmwood and, and yeah, Center yeah. and and yeah. So it's it's interesting. Like Celia and I were talking about after we saw you the other day, and we thought it was interesting. So you know, like Center School runs on the high school schedule. Is it Center School? No, Center, Center School's, School's with Elmwood. Elmwood. So yep. Center School's with Elmwood. So they're later. Yep. Because I'm. What time do you guys start at Elmwood? We start now at eight thirty. 845 ah so we I used to be Hopkins is the earlier time now ah, with the high school middle school gotcha um, Elmwood and because I remember when was, later oh okay so yeah. Hopkins was when it was later and I'm like oh my god half the day's gone <laughs> you right. know for me as a parent you right know, like I was just like and sometimes I have meetings at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning so right I want to get out you know get out of Dodge so it's 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 tough or get going yeah right. if you're trying to be at a nine o'clock meeting in Boston you have to wait to get the kid on the bus at yeah, that's hard. Yeah. So the other thought was, if it is a later start time, yeah. do we then do, um, 
you know, after extracurriculars, sure. of, after do we do them first? Right. So so kid comes to school for an hour before. Right. To Maybe do, like jazz band or, or jazz to do band drama. Doesn't, it could be anything. Right. Could be drama. Could be um, flag football. It could be any That's activity. That's a great idea. I Kids mean, are up. And, and about, you know, I, I do some... And maybe teachers would like that better, too, to get some of that extracurricular activity done in the morning as opposed to... Because we know our teachers stay after school. Well, I know. think I have to say um, from the teaching perspective, I think people can go both ways on do that. They? Ah. Because I know that um, when Elmwood School had that 7.30 start time, yeah. I preferred that. Right. Because then I got out earlier. I got out at 2.30. Gotcha. So when you start at 8.30, you get out at 3.30. Right. And um, Tim Kernan, who was at Elmwood School as a, as a second grade teacher and then assistant principal, went over to Hopkins as assistant principal. Yeah. Worked really hard to make the change ah. so that Hopkins had the earlier time because he liked being able to get in early, right. get out 2.30. Right. So that's when Hopkins became the earlier start gotcha. time and Elmwood shifted to the later start and time. And that only happened a few years ago because right. Celia was like later. Five years ago maybe. Yeah, so Celia was mm -hmm. always later and I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. you know, and coming yeah. home at almost four o'clock because right. we're at the end of the bus line and right. I was just like, geez, you know, like, you know. Exactly. And maybe, but maybe the younger kid, well, there's a benefit to the younger kids maybe coming home later because they don't have as much homework. So, you know, Celia's argument was like, you know, I get home and you know, at least I have some daylight and I'm kind of motivated and like and as, it gets, as it gets darker in the winter, like right. it's a little harder to kind of motivate yourself to do homework. Right, because at 2.30, you know, if they get out at 2 o'clock, they're home at 2.30. Yeah. Um, right. That may not be, you know, they, they can goof around a little and then get to the right. homework. Right, right. Um, and still go to bed not too late. Right. So I, it seems to me, I think kids can adjust to whatever Sure. Whatever it is. Right. So I think it's the pieces around it that, that really make the right. difference, like the sports, the parents' schedules. Right. Um, you know. And right. The kids and, can... it, and probably it's an open discussion. Like, with totally. that principal, when he went to Hopkins, he's like, well, wait a minute, let's, let's yeah. switch this. And yes. I think as a community, to be flexible to whatever right. the needs are at that time. Right. So that's probably the, the best the best way to kind of take it right but, you know as an early riser you yeah know, like I am I, too yeah you know what I mean I prefer the personally prefer the earlier state start time because when she started later I'm like it just felt like the day well was... I kept showing up to school at the 7 30 time oh you did yeah <laughs> yeah because you I was already to... up yeah. I was already up and ready to go yeah, but... like I've been up for two but hours but instead so... I do other things with that time right, right so speaking of time that's all we have for this it's... segment and uh, please feel free to Facebook us or, or email us your thoughts, even if you're thinking about it and you didn't get to send it in during the show. We'd love to respond at a later time Absolutely. or do another show okay. about it. Um, we're going to take a quick break and be back with Mike Tarosian and talk about lockboxes on senior homes. Is that a good thing or doesn't it matter? Thank you. Okay. All right. This week on HKM Ed. Hopkins High School honors its top of the hill inductees, Mike Whalen, Sarah Ellum, Scott Mackin, and Joshua Hanna. Wow, well, I very much appreciate those kind words, Coach, and I truly wish I could have been a better ball player on the diamond. That's why I ended up trying to coach the sport, because I was like, I could figure it out, maybe not as a player, but as a coach. And, uh, you know, that didn't even work out, so. My name is Kurt. My name is Nina. I'm Gunny. I'm Haley. Hi, Ray Davis. Jake. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name's Sophie. We're Al Gal and we love HCAMP. Hey, I like to be HCAMP. We love HCAMP. And I volunteer for HCAMP TV. And I watch HCAMP TV. And I love HCAMP TV. And I love HCAMP TV. We love HCAMP TV. TV. Woo! It right away. They call it snail mail, but it's not snail mail. I have some friends that you this trust. This week on you see them all the Character time. Matters, you know that. And Maji Wiggin finds out why it is good to be dependable. Walk away, right? And is there anyone in your life that you know is dependable? Um, teachers, staff, friends, family, um, and male people, many other kinds of people. And we're back. 
So now we're going to talk about senior lockboxes, um, and what I'll explain what that is. It's a lockbox on the house, and I'll let Mike get into a little bit more detail. That's so the fire department or police department could enter in case there's an emergency. So um, I think it's a great idea in disaster response, obviously. I think sure. it's an awesome idea, right. and in many of the communities I work across the state, we promote the senior lock boxes. Um, and most seniors are willing. I mean, they trust the fire department, they trust the police department. Right. And it, it, you know, it's for their health and safety. Right. So. Well, yeah, this all started when I posted Facebook, because everyone knows I work in Ashland, and, and we got a grant to uh, provide, I believe it was 30 lock boxes. That's awesome. And so we gave them to the seniors uh, through, it, it worked out through a program with the, um, with the outreach workers from the senior center. Okay. And people could have got themselves, installed them themselves, or yeah. with our help, we would go in and install them for them. Awesome. So you saw a poster that brought up the subject tonight, and the, you know, every firefighter loves to kick in the door. You know, don't get me wrong. What? But I would yeah, like to it's kick fun, in the door. it's cool. I think you know? it'd be fun. Well, they even <laughs> teach us how to I do hurt it. But, my leg. but what happens is uh, it's, 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 it speeds yeah. up our response, you it know, does. in a medical emergency. Uh, we can get in the house faster, and, and we could, of course, if there is a medical emergency, we get in the house faster, we're able to lock up the house when yeah. we leave exactly. yeah. Yeah. at the same cool. time. Um, so lock, lock boxes, people do it on their own. Yep. They can, you can go to Amazon, you go to any hardware store, buy a lock box. You get the kind that the realtors have that can, they fit like a big padlock on a railing. You get the kind that you screw onto a wall, yep. whatever. And what's um, the average cost of those? Just so people. They're minor. They, they range anywhere from $15 to $150. Right. All depends how fancy you want to get, where you want to put it, and so forth. Sure. And you put the key in, you come up with the combination. If you get the ones through the fire department, it's all going to be combination the same mm -hmm. because that's one that it's easier for us to remember. Absolutely. And we would also <laughs> ask you to make it our personal number so it's easier to remember. But, we keep it on file so when when there is a response to the home uh, a message is going to pop up that there is a lockbox yeah so if it's a fire department lockbox i will say on the radio it has a fire department lockbox right uh if there is a lockbox of their own mm -hmm. then what i'll do over their uh mobile units i will send them the passcode and the location because some people just as simple as under a mat yeah. in a barbecue grill right. under a rock and that's something to bring up as well, because a lot of people say, well, why would I buy a lockbox when I can just tell the fire department, hey, I hide my my key in the garage under the... But that's... You, you know what I mean? So That's where the bad guys look, though. Right, the first thing right. they got to look is under, under the, the mat, mat, under the and rock, under the potted plant. And that's something that always comes up. Sure. And, you know, like you think about that, like, well, you know, and they're like, well, why wouldn't I just tell... But then I think that puts liability on the fire department. And they'll be like, well, that firefighter, you know... He didn't he knew lock where, my door. Yeah, yeah, or he knew where the key is, so I don't know, right. you know. So that that also is a... Yeah, if, if a, if a location is ever caught by... I mean, there's sometimes that you just have to... Even if we had to say the location of that key over the radio, yeah. we do follow up and make sure they find a new location for it. That's, well, that's the last thing we want to do yeah. is everyone listens to the them. scanner. Yeah. So. That's no, true. A lot of people do listen to the scanner. Right. I think it is an app, right, on your iPhone. A scanner? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. When we yeah. have disasters going on, I'll pick up the apps in the communities that I have shelters. So I'll just open it up so I can hear the scanner in case right. something's yeah, going on as my volunteers are heading to help out at the shelter. So that's something I do on the disaster end and everything. You know, sure. like you like have to be in careful. In Hopkinton, we can go to HopkintonMA.gov yeah. and you can listen to police, fire, and DPW yeah. all on one channel yeah. all at the same time. Wow. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Learn something new every Learn day. Learn something new. So, so I, um, oh, go ahead. I looked. I yeah. um. I looked up a few things, and there were a lot of. There are a lot of towns that do this, yes. mm -hmm. which was really exciting oh, to me, because yeah. um, I think it's a great idea in terms of safety. I, my parents are 83 and 88, or 84 and 88, and if one of them had a problem and they were collapsed on the floor, and the other one called, you know, because they don't drive, yeah, um, then, then th they could be rescued, saved. Sure you know taken by ambulance somewhere well, because I, I think about when i was working for the busy nurses i could see the patient on the floor right <laughs> you and know so and i've had right. that well, happen then you have to break the window yeah not the door. I've, I've shimmied sure. through do windows yeah, to get you gotta to the do patient what you, gotta and, do. you know what i mean so it, you know it, that's that's a tough situation right the, the lock boxes make sense and it, you know yeah. anybody that's outside of our community can call their 
local senior center and see if there are any programs. So another real quick thing. So say you're not a senior. So mm -hmm. we're kind of promoting the lockboxes for seniors. Mm -hmm. But, you know, someone with a long-term illness. Mm -hmm. Anybody. Or yeah. anybody. You got, you got pets in the house. Right. Uh, you know, that you, fire and a pet whatever. In the house. Yeah, yeah. And Anything's that's one thing on. we bring up. Like, I think it's, and actually that will be on my list of things to do, <laughs> is to, you know, give the Hopkinton Fire Department some information about, my house, because like I don't want if there is a fire in the house, I have an alarm system that's hooked up to the police department. If they can get in my house without crashing through my sure, door, absolutely. that's that's right. a better way to sure. do it. Sure, then you and have to then, repair anything. You know, the pets or, or whatever. Yeah, we, before we ever try to knock down a door or break a window, oh, sure. we, we try all the windows. We look for the open car. Maybe there's a garage door opener. We oh. look for any other kind of way in before but you have to force. It's still time. I but mean, yeah. that's, a, that's time spent when you can go and, right. and, do and work on a patient. The issues, and yeah. that's right. what this, um, this article is from Amherst who put this talked about um 2015 they put the lock box in um and it's just the the box that holds the house key right um combination to open is selected by the homeowner they keep it on file with the police department there in amherst mm -hmm. um and then it said the comment was if they if there's a save if they need to save someone paramedics get in quickly quick access don't need to damage the house or climb through the window because that's time consuming. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and they, I guess they had installed about 70 yeah. that year, just in 2015. That's I'm good. sure it's more now. Um, but I never really thought about, I would think kicking a door in would be kind of quick, but it's, mm -hmm. it depends on the door and it well, depends so on the locks. So I've had my door locked yeah. before. I locked myself <laughs> out and I went to kick my steel door yeah. and I'm pretty strong, didn't budge. Yeah. I'm like, I'm thinking, well, I'll just well, kick for, it down. <laughs> first off, you waste time because it may take yeah. a couple hits. And you secondly, you, the yeah. firefighter or, or the medic could get hurt doing right. it, and now they can't care for you. Right. Make it easy. Keep it simple. Right. Put a key somewhere and, and let them in. So so the question is, how would we bring this? What would the steps be well, to bring it here in Hopkinton? I'll let you know what's going on here Thank in Hopkinton. You. Chief Slamman uh, has applied and successfully received, as far as I know, a safer grant Yay, for good. seniors. He's already spoken to the veterans at a veterans breakfast. Cool. And basically what is what we're doing is looking for uh, seniors to take care of themselves before they need yes. emergency services. Good. And one like of the ways what? they're going to do that is you need um, your house evaluated. Ah. You know, that's it's like, thing like for instance, if they find that your railing is in bad shape, yeah. they the firefighters will either come and fix it, right. or there's money in the grant to pay a, a licensed professional that's to awesome. fix it as well, because now if that railing is sturdy, yeah. you are less likely to fall. Right. So this is a grant, and the evaluation is paid for by the grant and any repairs. Correct. So how, what what age did this? Well, this is, is for, for seniors. What so, is that, 62, 65? Uh, that's a senior 65. today. I got my AARP card at 49, so I mean, I know, that's, that's, what that's I a mean. senior today. It's so uh, funny. Senior, <laughs> your, your seniors are basically 55 and over. Yeah, and, but that's AARP. That's not the senior for the right. And I'm not sure you could contact the Council on Aging on and that I'm one. I'm sure that's discretion on the fire department Absolutely. as well. So. well Right, exactly. And if if you, we're looking for our seniors, they're looking for the older folks. And a lot of older folks, a, a, a lot of them, they're too proud yeah. to have this done. They don't want to admit that. And it that. can be done so discreetly through the outreach workers right. of the senior center. Yeah. Uh, the great people down there, Marlene Troops. Uh, yeah. Uh, awesome. Fantastic. So you have super people to help you along. And through there, they could hook you up with the right people. Right. It, I mean, they could check your smoke detectors. They that was check. one thing I was going to bring up as right. the firefighters. Yeah. You know, when they come in and they do a home inspection. They're going to look at they're yeah. going to look at your bathroom and say, "Oh, look at this rug here. Yeah, it's it slips. It slips. You know, you, you need something that grabs. Maybe you need so rails they wanna, to get it out of the tub. Right. And they want to evaluate it. And so right now, the the process isn't uh, carved in stone yet, but uh, Chief Slamman is working on what the process and the steps will be. Do you contact the senior center first, yeah. who then contacts the, the fire department, department and so forth. So this so is just this steps is the, for the safe, this is just started. safe homes. Correct. And that, may, okay. So Stephen and Abby said they like our video on Facebook. Thank oh, yeah. you, Stephen and Abby. Yeah. And then there's a question, what about Amazon keyless entry? Could they connect with fire and police to let them in? I don't know anything about Amazon. I'm not videos. sure either. I don't know how that works. I do know that if you had a Nest app, but then you get a need of uh, a firefighter or an EMT to have yeah. uh, an app on their phone, right. which 
a lot of them will not carry their phones yeah. in their turnout care. So, well, right. you can't carry yeah. all those apps right. and use them all space Right. What you want to do is you want to make it as simple as yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. And the simple as possible is, is have a combination that can be manually turned. Right. And it's kept on file at the police and fire station. Well, and I think, too, just, you know, having continuity of what everybody does. Right. right. Because, you know, you could have all this information, and, you know, if there's no continuity, it, then right. it kind of dilutes what well, the program does. One of the one of the things right. that we do in that town, and I spoke to you about this earlier, is uh, when we were talking about disaster <laughs> prep, yeah. was we, have a, we work with the senior center very closely. And they provide us with a list of seniors that are on oxygen mm, dependent. Awesome. And then others <coughs> that seniors that are need. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones that need to keep an eye on when there's a power outage or Absolutely. there's a blizzard. Good. So we have ways to go and check on them. Yeah. And the list, it's just as simple as a Google Doc that is shared between the fire department, yep. police, That's and perfect. the senior center that yeah. is maintained by the senior center. Right. Mm -hmm. And they just, oh, this person moved away, they take yep. them off the list. Mm -hmm. And they're the well, ones that know because they they're in know. contact. Are, there was a lot of discussion many years ago for our health departments to kind of track that information. Sure. You know, and there was funding that was put towards it and it's just, it's very arduous to keep that information up really to date. Hard. So you really go to the folks, Senior Center Meals on Wheels, you know, busy nurses, those folks that do have that contact Especially with those folks. Especially when you have the senior center as vibrant as ours oh, in town. we really have a very it's, strong... It's incredible, just the volunteer base that they have yep. alone, uh, and the outreach work that they have, yep. uh, and that they, just as resources are, are, are more than what we could even talk about right now. Those are the people that you want to get in touch with. Those are the people that you want to coordinate with, yep. and that's what we do in the town next door. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and great. it's great. I mean, and I know with all my towns, this is something we're promoting quite a bit. And then from a disaster stamp response standpoint, too, those folks that may be stranded in the home. So, sure. you know, they may not they may not be able to get to the door because they have an electric wheelchair. So, you know, with disaster planning, what we look at is like identifying those folks. So we're working, having a partnership with the organizations sure. that care for those folks. And then, you know, like if something does happen, we can go out and help get that person out of that home and into a, right. into a shelter. And what we did at our fire station is we added to that list and it's just others' families. Yeah. You know, they may have a two-year-old that, yeah. that is on a, a breathing machine sure. or anything. So we, we add to that. It's not just seniors. Yeah, and um, I think that's so the needy, important. Needy residents needs. for yeah. different in, in our issues. next program, we just, we'll Kitty Fenwall, which is located in right. Ashland, yeah. just celebrated the 100th anniversary. They donated 100 smoking carbon dioxide combination awesome. detectors. Aww. And they are giving them to seniors and families in need. So. Awesome. Family Services Beautiful. and uh, Council on Aging both uh, compiling the list and we uh, give it out those uh, detectors. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. And I, you know, I can't, I think this program is just absolutely yeah, it's, amazing. Yeah, it's a start of things and this is things that Chief Slam has already been working on. And uh, as far as the detectors, that, that will come to fire prevention. I mean, of course, fire prevention has been real busy with all the building right. in town and so forth. But they're adding a second fire prevention officer on, which is yeah, great. Yeah, they need that. Because, you know, that will give you now three people doing inspections. You'll have a deputy who should be doing less inspections. Right. But you'll have two fire prevention officers in, awesome. in getting out there and taking care of the needs of families as well as seniors. So another thing that we've done in some of the communities I work in, people can actually donate the lock boxes to Absolutely. the, so say yeah. we get a grant, we can only do a hundred, but then some people, so if I bought one for myself, I wouldn't think twice about buying two or three more and then donating yeah. those. Every, to, every, every town has a gift account of yeah. some form or another. Yep. You know, we're very fortunate to have a great ambulance fund account in awesome. Hopkinton. So you can um, even take money because some communities can't take money. Right. But well, you could you could specifically say, hey, this is for earmarked for designated as right, lockboxes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And that's something you know we want to tell the viewers out there. If you do consider doing this for, I hope you do, for your home, but also maybe think about purchasing one and donating right. to the fire department, right. or maybe donating some funds if you can afford it to uh, we love all the help from the community to, I mean <clears throat> anything that we could do to put ourselves out of business would be great well, you know, awesome. that's, our, that's yeah. our goal in life. right well, so that's I, what you know? I look at for yeah. but I think the question is is our police slash fire um are our police and fire departments ready to implement the lockbox program yet well right now as a matter of fact the fire department for years have been putting lockboxes on buildings every commercial oh. 
building in Hopkinton awesome. has what's called a Knox box. Okay. Now a Knox box is a special like Fort Knox. Yes. Yeah, Can't break Knox. into it. <laughs> Knox is the brand, but it is a special lock box that is used areas. for every commercial building in this yeah. town, and it's it's all keyed the same to our community. Yeah. So every Knox box in town has the same key, and the fire department is the only one with the key. And the only way you can get a Knox box is you have to put in an application with the Knox box company, and it has mm. to be approved by the fire department. Mm -hmm. So you just can't get one for the sake of having one. Right. And then you order it. You get it on. You can even order them online now. Um, you get it for your town. Once you have it and it's installed, then we come and we put the keys. The, the pe even if you own it, you don't have access to right. it. Right. So you give us the keys department. to put inside. So in our town, then Hopkinton, we could all have Knox boxes. Sure, absolutely. Uh, because that's a system that's already in place. Correct. And it's one key one gets key. into all of those. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you could buy a Knox box, which let's say they cost. Twenty dollars, or you could buy one for ten dollars, or you buy one for five. I, like I said, the you can, they're all different prices. How do they key it though? If well, no, the ones that you would buy would be combination. Not, oh, okay, not okay. A key. Yeah, and I the think the combination the application it's also for the Knox box for businesses. It's specifically. It has to. It's specifically for business. Yeah. Okay. Can you get it for residential? Oh, I, don't I see. Know. Oh, I see. However, it has to be approved through the fire department. To get it, but you guys have pretty robust databases now, so yeah. it's pretty easy saying at eight cross street, this is where the key's located, yeah, it's and, and when you know what I mean, exactly. Or I mean, this you, is you where need the, the lockbox is, the trigger. yeah, you need the trigger for those, and we have that when uh, when when we pull up an address, we have a column, it's, it's something as simple as a spreadsheet, but we have a column yeah. that will say lockbox or any other note that we hidden yeah. key or right. whatever the mm -hmm. little secret uh, location is. But that's, so, you know, in, in talking to our viewers, I want you to tell your neighbors about this, tell your family yeah. members about this. And, you know, I think the more safe our community is and the more people that take a proactive stance and taking care of right. themselves the only, it's just going to help everybody right. the only way you're going to know if your town does it is ask for it right you know ask for it and, yeah. and i don't think there would be a i mean i work with fire departments all across the state even if they don't have a grant funding for it and you buy one we'll help you install they'll, or something they'll, that, they'll help you out some way yeah or fire departments are inc yeah. incredibly community oriented yep. and really want as long as we have the time i mean it's not i mean you, you have to answer those emergencies first but yeah you know if there's time in the day to come over and help you out we're gonna come and help you out yeah, yeah. yeah. well thank you so much thank you so yeah. much we Mike. appreciate your expertise thanks yes. for having me on and um and we appreciate your work in the fire departments in hopkinton as well as ashland thanks so. thanks very much we'll be looking forward to maybe having lock boxes here who and knows? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll have uh, Chief Slavin on to promote oh, his box, oh, box yeah. boxes. Or to talk about safe homes for seniors. I love yeah. that yeah. idea. That's a topic. Or yeah. everybody yeah, yeah. even, too. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we'll be Thanks. back. Yeah. And the next segment is going to talk about our skate park. Mm -hmm. It was new somewhere around 2003. It got refurbished in 2009. And this is a little while later. It needs a little work again. So we're going to talk about that. Please call us and tell us your thoughts when we're back. Every winter in New England, we have an increase in cases of carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a gas that's indetectable to our senses and can make you very sick or even kill you in a short period of time. Fortunately, carbon monoxide poisoning is entirely preventable. Ensure that you have your heating system and other home equipment maintained and inspected annually. Never operate gas-powered equipment indoors and never barbecue indoors. Make sure to have working carbon monoxide alarms on every floor of your house and within 15 feet of every bedroom door. They should be tested monthly. When snow falls, take care to make sure that chimneys, heating and dryer outlets are clear of snow so that exhaust can exit. Similarly, shovel out your car's exhaust and never allow children or other people to sit in an idle car while you're shoveling it out. If your carbon monoxide alarm ever goes off, don't ignore it. Exit your house and call the fire department. By following these steps, you can protect your family this winter. This week on Poetic Lines, Elizabeth Lund sits down with poet and filmmaker Carla Schwartz. Well, there is this poem, Moving Slips, right? And that's a poem that was actually inspired by a friend of mine whose first language wasn't English. And I keep this blog blog is wakewiththesun.blogspot.com and I said 
to, in my blog, I said, I'm going to move slips tomorrow. Hi, and we're back. We're going to talk about skateboard park. Um, this, I know you're a skateboarder. Yeah, and a s inline snowboarder. skater, snowboarder, yep. ripsticker, like anything with wheels on it. Yep. So, you know, like I, I love the idea of the skate park. Um, I have to say I met Celia's dad skating in Boston. Um, I don't want to say how many years ago. It was in the early 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we, you know, like I think skating is a great outlet for kids. And when Celia was younger and she would play at the playground and we would skate in the park and stuff like that. But I always saw kids over there using the right. park. But, you know, if it becomes dilapidated or unsafe or I know as a skater, you know, I was used to riding on the street. So I didn't mind bumps and stuff. But a lot of skaters don't like any imperfections in the skateboard park so that may be why there needs to be maintenance right and the, so this the article that i have here is from 2009 in the in the metro west daily news and they were saying after half a dozen years the skate park stood sat in disrepair so i'm so that means 2003 is when it was sort of built yeah loose screws ramps had holes drains didn't work um, but the high school, there was a group of high school students sure. who spoke up and, and tried to fix it. And I remember because this is my uh, friend of my son's, Joe Barra, mm -hmm. um, was a sophomore at the time. And they worked with the guidance counselor and they fixed it up. Um, and so, you know, Very minimal what was, cost, yeah. right, what was happening was skateboarders were all over the ramps at uh, the library. Right. They were <laughs> around the bank. Right. And then the Korean Presbyterian Church sure. and the Bill's Pizza parking lot. Yeah. You know, because those were awesome spots to skateboard, but right. not safe. So, well, I mean, back in the day, Randy and I used to skate all over Boston. Right. And now, <laughs> like, why this was before, I mean, this is when skating was really new. Yeah. And now they have, like, ridges on everything. And, you know what I mean? So, you know, most communities, I mean, at the time, I was like, that's so mean. But now as a, a more um, mature person, I understand why communities don't want skaters on. Not safe. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, um, so the police union donated $500 to the restoration Excellent. with the promise that they had to wear helmets. Good. That was the condition. Yeah, so good. under state law, 16 and under have to use a helmet when using a wheeled um, piece of equipment like a bike or a skateboard. And um, so they did renovate it. They raised money for additional ramps, um, and and I remember because I was on youth commission at that time. It was we actually had a person on youth commission that was working with the skateboard. That was um, Steve Johnson uh, was working with with the skateboard park people with the kids Excellent. at the high school. Phil Powers to help design, yeah, yeah just, and and get the fundraising. Yeah. So um, it's pretty minimal because Randy and I used to help out at a private skate park, and we've had friends that have had ramps in the back of their yards and yep. things like that so it's pretty minimal but I, I also think it's, it's an important outlet for kids I mean I think we need to offer aside from school sports I think we need to have areas where kids can actually go and exercise together and, and do something right. together and instead I mean, of being on the phone all the time yeah exactly yeah. and I right. think you know with today's sedentary lifestyle and right. everything's got the you know is AV or you know audio visual yeah they they need areas where they and I think it's a great investment I, I agree. mean and particularly in a community like Hoffington I think it's you know people yep. volunteer we have people volunteer for trails we have people from volunteer to do gardening right. you know what I mean and at the senior center so I think you know certainly if we, if there was a funding issue we could certainly well I'm we sure. just need to get you know maybe the youth commission needs to kick in again yeah um Tamori Seba is the new chair yeah. So um, bring you know, it to their eyes. Yeah, so that they would know be, it. and so maybe that that issue needs to come to the front burner again. Uh, this, uh, I wasn't even thinking about the skate park because I'm not over there anymore. You know, right. little kids. Right. Yeah. But we read an article at school about some kids who raised funds to put a skate park together in their town. Right. Because um, I think this is how it originated: was the surfers yeah. wanted to keep surfing. Mm -hmm. when it when the surf was bad or something yeah. or in the winter or they want so sure they developed the shorter boards with the wheels to be able to yeah. skate long boards and I have right one. instead yeah. of <laughs> surf so right. that's how skateboards uh, came to be long, based yes, on the surf boards, mm -hmm. right and then so the skate parks were essential 
And then, you know, the half pipe mimics yeah. the waves, the waves. Mm -hmm. and um, all kinds of the, the train park and doing. Right. So we and did so have many it. sports bumped off of it. It's not just skateboards. Absolutely. It's inline skates. You can do yep. it on a ripstick. You can do it on well, a but our BMX park, bike. You can do it on a, you know. Right. You but could, the one, the park we have is what I'm saying is. Yeah. So the kids that we were talking about with this article said, oh, yeah, we have a skate park here. And yeah. I said, you guys go there? And they said, no, it's kind of falling apart. Uh -huh. So I said, oh, well, maybe we should do something about that. Yeah. Do you think that should be fixed up? Yeah, we should fix that up. Yeah. So these are third graders. Uh -huh. um, but I'm sure if the third graders are saying it's a mess. The older kids are. Then, then it is a mess. The, third, the older kids, it's got to be a mess. Right. So um, this is something that is a valuable piece of our community, it's I a think. a resource. Yeah. Resource, and it's something the kids can do, like you were saying, for activity. Right. Also... Marathon School, the new school, is going to be put in adjacent oh, it's right next to, to EMC it. Park. Right. So then you're going to have more of a flow of, of kids going back and forth because so there's a pathway there. That's an idea, too. I mean, sometimes when you're building a school, that's a perfect opportunity to bring awareness to maybe updating EMC mm -hmm. Park. Right. You know, so that's, you know, in per particularly where it's an elementary school, so a lot of kids, I mean, wouldn't have... Well, K-1, I'm not sure if they're... I'm not sure if they're skateboarding, but mm -hmm. there will be some Silly first ones, graders. Yeah. Right, there will yeah. be some first graders. I'm not sure about kindergarten yeah. on on that equipment. Right. But certainly, you know, there's a possibility. And and along with that, family goes to the park. Right. Kids are on the swings, older kids on the skateboards. Yeah. It's just win win. And so, I just think it provides more and you know, there's a softball park there right, and stuff exactly. like that. So I think the more multi-use it is, I think it's just mostly beneficial to the community. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, backing up a little when I was younger, and yeah. we used to kind of travel around looking for skate parks to skate at. Um, but I think, you know, as a community, we need to kind of come together and, and think about maybe improving it or making it, because the ramps are kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what Could I mean? And you can have smaller and bigger ramps and things like that. And I, I wonder if a construction company would be willing to donate time or materials or, well, you know, I there's think, a lot of things that can be done. That, right. And I think there may be, there may be construction people who have kids yeah. who are interested in the skate skateboarding yep. so that that you know or i know brad mayo's kids are too old he's a fence guy right so you know i think there are there could be a kind of a, right. a partnership there of a family who's got an interest because their own child right. would access that right and, and the kids would love the i think it'd be a yeah. fun activity for the kids to actually think about how to design the park because i remember when randy and right. i were younger the kids just thought we were so cool because we skated all over the place but the little kids would just they love to be involved and then they can learn about construction there's you know there's architecture kind of that goes along with sure. it so it's a well, great engineering you have engineering. to figure out load and, yeah. and torque and yeah you know, and, and actually vert is what we always and, talked about yeah. like when you build a skate park you want to think about how much vertical right yep. vert there is mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know and that affects on how you know the skate you know, like yeah. how you end up riding it, you right. know, sure. is probably the best term for that. But I think it's, you know, I think it's a great idea. And I've even seen kids kind of running and playing on it, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you don't have to have a skateboard or you don't have to have inline skates or you don't have to have, you know, a ripstick or, you know, those scooters that the kids Ripstick use. would be hard to use on that, though, because yeah. you have to... Oh, motion I've used for, it on there, yeah. You have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can ride it because it turns like a snowboard. Oh, can coast. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you can go right up on the lip and, yeah. you, you okay. know, stuff like that. I so. don't know if people realize they could use a ripstick on yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, and people use the little scooters. Right. And, you know, there's all kinds of uses for it. And Razor scooters. Yeah, and, so, ooh. but, I mean, I think it's, you know, a good idea, and... And even in the winter, kids can kind of sled on it if there's snow on it. So there's right. a lot. Right. So if of... it was bigger, it would be could be a snow park as yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, I mean, you can't really have it all covered with snow. Yeah. Actually, we have that hill back there. I mean, I know kids could slide down that hill, but again, it's just another obstacle really for kids to play on, even if it's covered with water or snow. I mean, I know Celia would play on anything when she was little. So I think just having that area where they can actually climb yeah. and <laughs> yeah. do what kids do you know? right so um let us know what you guys think if you're watching and you think a skate park renovation is a good idea we need to get some 
grassroots movement here right and uh, I get this done well another thing that is a thought too is um, the Milford rail trails up the street and I know when it first got built Celia and I went and decided to do all eight miles on the ripstick which was good and bad we were really t you know like that's a little much to do on a ripstick but you know it, it that's another thought you know I mean it's not that far away but as we talk about trail connectivity right and having paved roads and things like that, instead of having kids go downtown, wouldn't it be nice to have some, the sidewalks or some areas where kids can yeah. kind of skate around? Well, it's interesting. I think that the, the talk about the rail trail includes that pebble surface. Right, which not, is not skating. Not a skateboard no, ripstick surface. And that's so something, just that discussion. No, and I know that because yeah. I, I, I worked on that quite a bit. But it's, you know, like as a skater, like I think it's, you know, it's nice to be able to kind of skate around. If kids come from downtown and they skate to the park, because that's what I would want to do if I lived on Hayden Row or or wherever downtown. Down I the would, access road. Yeah, I would like to just skate down there. And I, you can skate on the street, but you really can't skate on Hayden Row. No. So that's, you know, so it's something to kind of think about is if we do move forward with this project to think about other ways right. that we make, I guess, the park itself more accessible, not just for skating, but... Well, the other thing is, I don't know if there's any way to put something on the street for people that don't know or, or, right. or some kind, kind of leaflet or flyer yeah. to say what's in there right because i don't know that people know there's a skate park in there right and you know? i think that's true and, and and just the uses of it and i think when people have more interest than that that drives it i i would love to see so like you go down the charles river there's like pull-up bars and there's stuff that you can do to work out so maybe that circuit would be train yeah circuit, circuit training so that's something you know beyond the skate park maybe that's we enhance that park as a whole i mean not just the skate park but mm -hmm. look at other options Life. to make the yeah. the park more useful to mm -hmm. everybody because i would have loved when celia was playing on the swings or running around to be able to work out mm -hmm. with with her in eyesight so that's that's another idea beyond the skate park is really to kind of make it more useful and maybe even have a little track around it. So you know I'm, what I mean? So, so now I'm thinking wellness department at the high school yeah, could yeah. access that. It's right across the street. Sure. And and there could be a CrossFit component to it. Absolutely. Because you could have some equipment that would be a CrossFit yeah, just, kind of Yeah, pull up bars. All you need is bars. and there's, yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. You can have yep. a couple of steps that you could jump up on or ledges or I mean there's all kinds of stuff that could happen mm -hmm. and I think the more we make that park more useful the I more agree. people access it the only issue with it and I'm sure you remember this when Molly was younger is parking oh yeah so parking there has always been kind of tight right. so that's you know but now we, they can park at the at the school ah I certainly think. during off hours right during so off hours right. there's, there's, because there's a pathway between the school and this park right also park at the high school right and, and walk, walk in right um so but that uh, that also lends to it being developed more i mean right. really turning into more of a multi-use yeah. functional because i mean just as a parent i would have loved to sure you know like be able to and i i know a, the kids do that little loop around the thing but yeah. I, I think there's there's an opportunity you could have kind of a little rock climbing wall you could have yeah you know there's a lot of things and maybe you do activities Mm -hmm. Like with older kids that kind of mentor well, younger parks kids. Parks and Rec. Yeah, Parks and Rec. Parks I and mean, Rec could almost get in like it. what the YMCA does. So, right, the rock know, climbing. That, those, yep. are, those are some ideas mm -hmm. that we may want to kick around just beyond the skate park, is just to really think about yep. expanding the use of that park because obviously, and then the, the school will benefit as well. Right, right. So, if it's a, if it's a fitness area, mm -hmm. They can have recess out there. Or yeah, ropes course. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Then I don't know that it would be a K-1 right. uh, ropes course that would have but to be safer. But you could do it in levels. I mean, and it certainly could be available to middle school, Hopkins, yeah. high school, because those are all now yeah, they're all connected. In, in close proximity. Yeah. And so. maybe it even gets, I mean, I when Silly went to Hopkins, I used to walk around on all the trails back right. there. So maybe that's yep. something we think about right. for... A lot of those areas back there that use you know like making center trail yeah center trail but not only center trail there's that pathway that goes between hopkinton 
or Hopkins and the Access Road. I used to cut through there. There's yep. like a nature path there, and then there's another path up behind Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a few ways that we could, oh, yes. you know, know, I think just looking at our kids, and, you know, I was, I've been really involved when Michelle Obama was doing the Let's Move program. We need to get kids moving. And right. if we it's have so that stuff great. that's inviting, I mean, they're like, oh, looking at the woods, mm -hmm. and they've been told not to go in the woods, but maybe if we make it, more mm -hmm. user friendly, mm -hmm. you know, just really parks and rec, you know, just maybe have a discussion of how mm -hmm. we can m make the outdoors more open and accessible right. to all the all the citizens of Huffington and right. people from outside of well, Huffington. Well, especially because I value that as one of the great resources we have here, as yeah. we've said before. Yeah. So let's let's help people understand why that's so important. Right. Um, and beyond just the trails, right. you know, really um, so many wonderful places. Well, that's the thing. And we have all this, we have a lot of space. I mean, yeah. for someone who's athletic and likes to do things outside, I just see a huge opportunity yeah. to really to expand far. kind of that whole area. Right. And, and, you know, like even, for example, when your older kids are playing sports, you know what I mean? If you can kind of hang out and maybe do something next to them or you know what I mean? Cause like mm -hmm. I always wanted to kind of work out when Celia was doing cross country or you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So there might be ways that we could use that property, you know, think about innovative ways to kind of make yeah. it more accessible because I think people, the lack of activity now is, is really a problem. And I, I from a public health standpoint, it's a huge problem, mm -hmm. you know, obesity, diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, heart failure, strokes, I mean, all of that is related to, you know, inactivity. And right. I think if there's ways that we can kind of promote that activity in our community, I think it's I think it's just win-win for everybody. Right, and I think uh, that, that makes me think of things like the Timlin race yeah. and all of the 5Ks. And I did, I walked 13.1, you know, for Jimmy Fund. Yes. But if I only do that once a year, right. that's not great. Right. That's not great for my knee or my foot or whatever. Right. You know, right. so, your body's so, not used to that, that use. So there needs to be an ongoing thing. Well, maybe that's something that sparks. That you don't have to pay for, like CrossFit. Right. Or you have clubs, informal clubs. You get together, you know, like mm -hmm. I have friends that I work out with all the time. We yep. post on Facebook or whatever. Yep. We say, hey, let's go work out here. So I have that's, to say, we did a, I did a great thing the other day at Cycle City, just a little shout out. Yeah. Um, Mary Murphy organized a bunch of people awesome. to do some spinning, which I had never done. So yeah. I had to, it took it's me a little fun. while to get used to. But we are out of time. So yeah. we are looking forward to seeing you next time. Think about these things. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.